week on ANN News Kids, we'll be talking about the Haiti president assassination. The diamond found in Botswana, which could be the second largest in the world. The Bangladesh fire causing 50 people to die and COVID-19 vaccines and statistics. The country of the week is Romania and Sanri was the first to guess it. Congratulations. We're talking about 4th of July in the Extra Fun segment and we're talking to Amanda Saramaga, the UNDP resident representative of Mauritius and Seashells. Hope you enjoy and don't forget to like, subscribe and share. Jovenel Moise, the president of Haiti, was assassinated in his home in Port-au-Prince, the capital. He and his wife were shot and he died right on the spot. The assassins were 28 foreign soldiers and the police caught most of them, but a few are still on the run and three were shot dead. The motive and the person behind all of this is still unknown, but the president was 53 years old and had been disputing with the opposition about his presidency term for about a year. He said that in 2022, he would end his presidency term after a five-year term. But the opposition demanded that this year in February, he should have stepped down. We don't know who's going to take over as the president, as the president of the Supreme Court recently died of COVID-19. In Botswana, the second largest diamond in the world was unearthed. It's the second big diamond found in just a few weeks. In June, a 1,098 carat diamond was unearthed in Botswana, and this one is 1,174 carats, which is much larger. Botswana is the largest producer of diamonds in Africa, and even the second largest diamond in the world came from Botswana. In Bangladesh, in a juice factory, more than 50 people died because of a horrible fire. The fire started because of the presence of flammable substances and chemicals. 25 were rescued, but most of them were injured. Some people even started jumping out of the windows to save themselves, but unfortunately, many died that way too. Today, Biotech and Pfizer announced that there will be a third dose of coronavirus vaccine two months after the second dose. They said that it's for the best protection available. Countries like South Africa have been struggling with the new variants of coronavirus. The top three countries with the most coronavirus cases are USA, India and Brazil, which are also the top three countries with the most coronavirus deaths. So could you please start by introducing yourself? So my name is Amanda Kabedja Saramaga, and I'm the UNDP resident representative uh, for Mauritius and Seychelles. Thank you so much. And um, can you explain a little bit more about what you do in UNDP? Okay. So as you may know, UNDP is part of the United Nations. We're well, one of, of 23 agencies, funds, and programs. And what I do is that I represent the head of the United Nations Development Program. And what we do is we, do, we support governments and communities in human development work in at least 177 countries. And so my responsibility in Mauritius and Seychelles is to support government to run programs that can help them achieve the development goals that they have for the country. Oh, wow, that's really nice. And what brought you into this field? Well, I mean, it's quite interesting, I think. Um, I actually started off studying humanities in English, and uh, I was always very interested in just how human beings interact, why they behave they do in society and so on. And then of course, just English literature and language. 
And then as I graduated from undergraduate work, I realized that I was very much interested in why some people have and why some people don't. So then I went to law school and I became a lawyer and I mostly did what we call generally things to do with poverty law. So essentially all the areas of law that you'll be familiar with, but really focusing on a client base of what was poor people, refugees and immigrants and that sort of thing. And then after that, um, I did that for, for a while. And then after that, when I moved back to Africa, I grew up in Canada. When I moved back to Africa, I decided that I wanted to do uh, the same kind of work, but not representing individuals, but working on a whole of society and whole of community. And so I started working with an NGO. I worked with government for a little while as an advisor. And then in 2008, I joined the United Nations and I was working in Sudan, in Khartoum. And if you know any, some about the history about Sudan, they were going through a, a rather difficult time in terms of a peace agreement between North and South Sudan. And so I began to work on justice sector reform issues. And I joined the UN as a, a sort of a, a, a legal advisor. And over the years, I've been with the UNDP now for about 14 years. And so over the years, I've gotten promoted and gone on, you know, here and there. And here I am. I'm now a resident representative in Mauritius and Seychelles. Wow, well, that's amazing. Yeah. What a journey. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. And uh, what do you enjoy the most about your profession? To be honest, I would say that it's people. It's engaging with people and communities, having conversations, coming up with ideas of how things can be better. So, for example, um, I've worked, for example, in women in prisons and talking about how, how some women can end up in prison, what kind of skills and support they would need so that when they come out of prison, they would be able to have better lives and there wouldn't be a chance that they would go back to, uh, um, to finding themselves in conflict with the law, as we state. Other things that we do, for example, in Mauritius and Seychelles, is we're doing a lot of work in terms of the environment and work about, you know, coastal erosion. And I don't know if you're familiar with the artificial reef at Morshoisy, for example, in Mauritius. Uh, UNDP was part of the process of actually piloting. This is an innovative technology that allows you to put artificial coral reefs just near to the beach so that you can change the wave motion and patterns so that the beach doesn't erode as much. Or working on, for example, renewable energy, as you know, countries like Mauritius, small island states, really rely a lot on fossil fuels. And we know that fossil mm -hmm. fuels are not good for the environment. So helping the government think through how they can transition to a low carbon economy, which is about taking advantage of the God-blessed um, environment, which is having a lot of sunlight and being able to have renewable energy. So what I enjoy about my job is thinking about new ways and innovative ways of doing things, talking it through with communities, government officials. We raise the money to try out new things and we, we then focus on implementing them. Wow. Thank you. And how has COVID-19 affected what you do? Well, luckily for us as the UN, we've been able to work remotely. So for us, you know, on the 18th of March last year, when the government was forced to shut the, the borders and sort of have us in confinement, we were very quickly able to switch to remote working or what we call teleworking. We're all connected to the internet. We're all working in a, in a digital way. And so we were able to continue to work and to contribute to the same work that we do. And interestingly, we've now supported government actually in rolling out a work from home policy, which you may know was adopted by the cabinet about three weeks ago and talking about how business continuity or work can continue even if you have to change the way in which you work. So for us, COVID has actually been obviously a very devastating social, economic and health problem but it's also showed us, I think, a new way of working, which is that even if it's probably ideal to meet your colleagues and friends and partners once in a while, it doesn't mean that you cannot continue to be as productive as necessary, even if you have to work digitally, just the same way we're having a conversation now. We found that we actually delivered more programmatically during 2020 than we did in 2019. 
Wow. Thank you. So in some ways, there were quite a few benefits. Mm -hmm. And you talked about climate change and how you're now helping to go carbon neutral in these small islands. Uh, you, are, you already said that uh, fossil fuel fuels are a big cause of this and mm -hmm. why you want to uh, really encourage uh, being carbon neutral in small islands. What other causes are there? What other causes are there of... Uh, like, why do you want to do this on small islands? You already said that uh, it was because of these fossil fuels. Are there are any other reasons that the smaller islands are lacking, um, are lagging behind in the world? Yeah. Well, the most interesting fact, I think, is that small islands do the least damage to the environment. They're small populations. Um, they have a very limited carbon footprint, so to speak. However, they suffer the most from climate change impacts, whether it's the rising sea level, whether it is the fact that um, their, their coral reefs, which are very important in terms of the, the regeneration of Earth's natural resources, get damaged, whether it's the fact that, you know, in terms of being able to, food, to produce food, um, with the climate change and climate, and you know that, for example, Mauritius and Seychelles, for that matter, import a lot of their consumables. So could they grow more if the weather was more favorable? So it's important to understand, I think, that for small island developing states, climate change is an existential question. Climate change represents an alteration of the livelihoods of the way people uh, live and how they work. And also, to a certain degree, there's also an economic issue. You know, Mauritius and Seychelles are beautiful islands, and people come for the pristine beaches, they come for the fresh air, they come for all the other opportunities, the communities they can engage with. And as those natural assets deteriorate due to climate change, whether it's colder or whether it's warmer or whether it's just not a conducive environment, it does have an economic impact. So for the, for the small island developing states and the UN, we think it's important that not just because they are the least polluters, but they suffer the most, but also because in terms of their, their existence and their continuation to thrive and strive for human development, they're being greatly affected by climate change. Yeah, that is true. Yeah. Very true. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. And uh, what advice do you have for kids? Well, I mean, I thought about this question and I thought it was an interesting question. And what would someone have, what would I have wanted to hear when I was your age? Yeah. And when I look back on it, one of the things I, I think I, is really important is that you have to do things that you love. And what I mean is that um, a career is more than a job. It has to be something that every day when you get up in the morning, or at least most days when you get up in the morning, you want to go to work because you're excited about the possibilities of what you can do. So I think it's really important to pursue ideas and passions that speak to not only your economic interests, but they speak to your values and they speak to the world that you want to see. Um, I think um, there's a, I don't know whether it's Buddha or Gandhi or someone said, be the change that you want to be. So in other words, don't spend a whole career pursue or a lifetime pursuing things that are only about material gain. You have to focus on things that are also about a spiritual gain and also about evolving as a human being. The second thing that I, I would want to say is that um, life is long. Life is long. And so one of the things I wish I had more when I was younger was patience. And what I mean by patience is the willingness to slog away at something, to work hard at something, to understand that if I joined an organization or I was pursuing a particular objective, that I shouldn't expect to have results tomorrow or the day after, that I need to be willing to put in a couple of years, two, three years, working hard, being focused, and making sure that I'm giving everything that I can to the best of my ability at that time to know that you know, over time things will change. I've been working now, I think I've been working professionally probably for around 25 years. And uh, I can tell you that I started off as a community volunteer when I was a, a very young lawyer. 
And it's taken me 25 years to get to a space where I still feel I'm pursuing the things I love, but I'm just changing the role and the nature of what I do in terms of that space. So you can still do the same thing, but you just have a different role in terms of the cogs of the wheel of how you contribute. So my message to young people is stay focused on what your passion is, but understand that how you contribute to your passion will change over time as you age and as you grow. Okay, wow, that's wow. very interesting. Thank, Thank you, you so, so much. much. Very nice. You're most welcome. Have a great, great weekend. Thank, Thank you. You too. Have a nice day ahead. You too. Bye-bye. July 4th is the American Independence Day and it's celebrated all around the country. In 1776, the Declaration of Independence was adopted by the Continental Congress. The vote actually took place on July 2nd, but it was celebrated on July 4th. It was actually not signed on July 4th, but actually in August that same year. Three U.S. presidents have died on July 4th. Thomas Jefferson, John Adams, and James Monroe. In 1870, the, it was declared a federal holiday. All the descendants of the founding fathers ring the Liberty Bell 13 times to celebrate the 13 colonies on the Independence Day of USA. The framed Macy fireworks in New York City are actually 75,000 fireworks and cost $6 million. Oh. John Adams, the second US president, believed that it shouldn't be celebrated on July 4th, but actually July 2nd. And he declined all invitations to everything he had on July 4th. La Roumanie est un pays européen et c'est connu pour Transylvanie, ses villes médiévales, ses églises et ses châteaux de la légende Dracula. Sa capitale est Bucarest et sa population est de 19,5 millions d'habitants. Son glacier, Scarisoara, est le deuxième plus grand glacier souterrain d'Europe. La route Transfagarin est la plus belle route au monde. Les vues sont fantastiques là-bas. Les cimetières joyeux y exposent des croix peintes avec des dessins et avec des dessins colorés. Cette attitude joyeuse envers la mort vient des Das, les ancêtres de Romania, qui croyaient que la mort était un passage vers une meilleure vie. Il y a 6000 ours bruns là-bas, avec un total de 200 000 ours bruns du monde. Là-bas, il y a la plus grande sculpture d'Europe. C'est une sculpture d'un Das et Bram Stoker a créé le comte Dracula qui habitait dans un château de Bron qui est trouvé en Roumanie et qu'on peut visiter aujourd'hui aussi. <musique> 